just remain standing, if you would, just another few moments in honor to the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 5. Great to see all of you here in the house of the Lord, to the leadership of IBC. Amazing, extraordinary. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it is at least the largest Bible college in North America, possibly in the world or ranks at the very top anyhow, and uh, that is because of burden, passion, and leadership from Pastor Mooney on down. Hallelujah. Why don't we thank the Lord for the staff of IBC. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. My name is Brother Steve Waldron. I have uh, been teaching here. I think this is my 14th year. I was four years full-time, three years full-time on campus, one year full-time pastoring and flying back and forth. The rest of the time, it's just night classes, Science in the Bible 1, Science in the Bible 2, Christian Evidence is 1, Christian Evidence is 2, pastoring a couple churches in South Georgia. And uh, today we're going to look at the title of a very famous book, and many of you probably heard about it, but what the information is not going to be necessarily what's found in that book. It just, the, the title just fit what I felt like the Lord was giving me to speak here today, and it's the making of a man of God. And so, of course, we would say the making of a man or a woman of God, but a, the making of a man of God. Second Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse number 5, says, Of such a one will I glory. And this was somebody taken up into the third heaven debate rages, whether that was Paul or someone else. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities, my weaknesses. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Let's everybody say a thorn in the flesh. A thorn in the flesh. Again, some say ophthalmologia. Some people say something else. But there was a thorn in the flesh, and we do know the immediate identifier of that is the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So it's okay to pray prayers more than once. Paul did. Jesus did. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, we tend to glory in great services and miracle signs, wonders, healings, people receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost, baptisms in Jesus' name. Paul said, that's great. We do need to glory in all of that. But he said, I will also glory in my infirmities. And this is why. He says, most gladly, therefore, rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The making of a man of God. Why don't we just ask God to do everything he wants to do here today. Hallelujah. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have gathered together in your presence, the presence of the holy angels, God. And we are here, Lord Jesus Christ, to see you work in our lives and our hearts in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, on a daily basis, you work with us, God. This is just another in a long stream of life and existence. But God, we want something from you today. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, do miracles in our lives, do wonders in our lives. Live through us, be through us, work through us, do through us, Lord Jesus Christ. God, in Jesus' name, keep our hearts and minds upon you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us open our hearts, our lives, to receive of this engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Call people to preach here today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give clarity of ministry, clarity of vision, encouragement, God, in Jesus' magnificent holy name. And God will give you all the glory and the honor and the adoration. It all belongs to you, worlds without end. Hallelujah. We glorify you. Why don't we just glorify the Lord? Thank him again. Glory to the name of Jesus. 
your matchless name, Jesus, above every name. you turn to a neighbor and just say, God is good, and you can be seated in the name of the Lord. Amen. We just read about Paul glorying in infirmities, and some would say, well, that's just because Paul was a special case, but that's, that's really not the way it is. In the book of Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse number 2, we see that Paul encourages this church he had not yet had the privilege to even get to yet to do the same thing, to glory in tribulation and infirmity. And so when we get to Romans chapter 5, verse number 2, it says this, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's the hope of heaven, the resurrection. In verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. So rejoicing in tribulation, and all things give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. And, uh, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So it doesn't say to worship God necessarily for all things, but in all things. We give God glory, we worship Him. Now I will say, when I was sitting where you're sitting some 30 to 32 years ago, not at Indiana Bible College, by the way. It was at a now defunct Bible College, Jackson College of Ministries, some 30 to 32 years ago. Um, I remember the looking at the different students I was with. And I was reminded this past general conference, I had someone I graduated with, Scott Sistrunk, just was elected the home missions director. I saw another name on the screen to get voted on uh, Brent Brosom for uh, an executive presbyter. I, I saw uh, another person, Secretary of Home Missions, Scotty Slayton, graduated the year after I did. And many are pastors. Many have been missionaries. Many are in ministry. Most, I would say, are in ministry. Some have cast off the faith. But all of us took different paths in the making of a, a man or a woman of God. There were certain conceptions and perceptions that I had as I sat where you were sitting, and some proved to be true, and some proved to not necessarily be so true. One of the things that I always try to do in teaching, especially teaching students, is to not just teach theory, but to teach actuality, things that I have experienced and things that I have seen others experience in the process of the ministry. And there is a process, and I know that is a very popular term now, that people go into the process. Um, people talk about, like in football, you have Nick Saban at the University of, of Alabama. In Georgia, they lovingly call him Nick Satan. I, I'm not sure why they do that, but uh, Nick Saban and he talks about a process that he takes people through. Again, in Georgia, they jokingly say, yes, he takes five-star recruits and makes them four-star recruits. And uh, anyhow, that, but he has, is very famous for taking players through a process. And it has entered the popular vocabulary of a process. But really, there is a process, according to Scripture, that even after the new birth process and even the new birth experience that we have, that then with our calling, our particular vocations and callings, wherewith we're called, according to Ephesians chapter 4, there is a process. There is, there is still a, a molder and a maker of man's hearts. There is still a potter, and we are still the clay. And there are certain things in our lives that we don't even know we need to be strong in. We don't even know they exist in our lives. But the master maker, the creator of the universe, he sees within us and he brings us through circumstances that if we will react correctly to the circumstances that he does make us and mold us into his image after his likeness. For in Romans 8.30 we read that the final end, what goal, the goal that God is looking for, it says... Um, in verse 29, by whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed. Let's everybody say conformed. Conformed to the image of his son. 
that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so the scriptures are given to us to look at hope and to look at experience and to look into a glimpse of the mind of God and just to see how he does certain things. And I think everyone here would like the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Could you say amen? Amen. So but the ministry of the Apostle Paul and the results that the Apostle Paul had, there was a process that he went through. First of all, he was not even converted till he was 31 years of age or so. And as we go through these chronologies, the emphasis is not necessarily on the accuracy of the chronologies, even though I did try to be as accurate as possible. But there is certain uh, vagaries and there are certain even disputes within these chronologies. But it is to say these are approximations, but what was going on at the time? And so Paul known as Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor of Christians, was converted at the age of 31. And then after trying to convert other people for three years, according to the book of Galatians, the first chapter, he went into Arabia and was taught by Jesus Christ himself. Then after a trip to Jerusalem, he makes a journey back to Tarsus. And while he was involved in some sorts of ministry that you can piece together from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and all of the adventures and the, the beatings and the struggles that he went through for four years, he was in Tarsus until the son of encouragement comes, that son of consolation by the name of Barnabas to bring him to this great revival in Antioch. And so Paul was 38 or 39 years of age by this time when he begins to dominate the narrative under the Holy Ghost of the book of Acts. God was still moving all around the world, but, but God was sharing this life of the apostle Paul for us for a reason. And so he was 38 or 39 before he enters in this time, in this season of great revival, a missionary journey, another missionary journey, three years in Ephesus approximately, another three years in Corinth, seeing incredibly dark, evil, and wicked cities that we probably could not comprehend how evil and how wicked they are because we still have this glowing image of a Christian America. Though it is fading, we're shocked. You would be shocked at how there is still, there is a glimmer of just some of the basics of niceties and civilization that uh, are reminders of an ancient Christian America that still smolder in the embers of this disintegrating society. So it would shock us, the evilness of Ephesus. It would shock us, probably, the evils of Corinth. And at age 47 or so, we see him at the Jerusalem conference in Acts chapter 15. And by this time, he has only been on one missionary journey. The revivals of Corinth and Ephesus have not yet happened. And then we realize that Paul probably reached the penultimate of his ministry when he was in his 50s. This is something that would would not be what we would think. We would think God maybe would use him while he was strong in his youth. But yet God chose to use him in his 50s. And you'll find that God does that a lot. That God wants all of the glory. That the only flesh that God loves, the only flesh that God likes, the only flesh that God accepts is dead flesh. And no glory, no flesh will glory in his presence. So he is in his 50s in the time of his greatest ministry. And then from approximately 58 A.D. to 63 A.D., he is somewhere around 56 to 61 years of age. That's if he was born in 2 A.D. Many people think he was born somewhere around 1 B.C., 1 A.D. There is no zero A.D., but there's a 1 B.C., 1 A.D. But if he was born in 2, he was 56 to 61. And what he was doing then is he was spending five years in prison. 
Friend, we're seeing this all around the world. There is a tremendous revival going on in Asia right now. One of the fascinating things of demographers and studiers of church growth is they are noticing that the church is moving progressively. The center of the church is moving in our world southwardly and westwardly southwardly and westwardly. A hundred years ago, 95% of all who called themselves Christians in the world lived in the West. Now 30% of everyone who calls themselves a Christian lives in the West. 70% of those that call themselves Christians live in what's known as the two-thirds world. I'm sure you hear about this in classes, many classes and other places all of the time. But 70% of those that name the name of Jesus Christ live in the in the two-thirds world. They live, many of them, in the 1040 window. And there's amazing revival going on from 10 degrees north latitude to 40 degrees south latitude. And in Africa, in that 1040 window, it's estimated that 60% of everybody in that 1040 window in Africa is Pentecostal. They have all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. So there is a tremendous move of God, and they know what prison is like. They know what it's like. I've got a friend of mine. He goes to China about five times a year. I won't mention his name, but he is used mightily in the country of China, and he talks about how universities over there will invite him to speak in their Christian universities, and about once a month that they will take a journey into the mountains. And what they're going there for, it's not for classroom, even though that's kind of what the communists think, but they go so they can worship God in the mountains because they can't worship God. I'm sure Brother Turner, Brother Rodenbush know all about these things and because they can't worship God. You wrote the book on China, literally. Amen. And uh, so it, they worship God in uh, the mountains. Or was that somebody else? That's Brother Rodenbush. Okay. But uh, they wrote the book on these goings on. And so they go to the mountain so they can worship God because they can't worship God freely because they'll be arrested by the communists. The communism is, is officially atheism. Whenever you hear communism, you think atheism. Socialism is officially atheist as well. That's the reason those political philosophies are more than political philosophies. They're actually cultural wars. They are actually things that are an attack on Christian society and uh, these type things. And so I know my own pastor was a missionary, Brother Sam Latta, and he talked about going to the Middle East and the United Arab Emirates, and they would rent out hotel rooms on the 70th floor of high-rise hotels, and they would have church and uh, But still, because of the Islamic influence, when people would receive the Holy Ghost, they'd have to put the hotel pillows over their face because uh, if they spoke in tongues very loud, you know, it could be the authorities would come and kill them. And this is what Paul was undergoing. He was five years in prison somewhere from the age 56 to 61. And then we find out what this making of the man of God, what Paul went through, this one that wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, either 13 or 14 books of the New Testament, we find out what he was going through in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23. And, and this is a very popular passage of Scripture, and I know people preach about it often, but I just really felt like we need to read it again. And, and, and he says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. He said, I can't even count the number of times I've been beaten. In prisons more frequent. In deaths off. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and the day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils by mine own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness. In painfulness. In watchings often. Watching for his life. In hunger and thirst. In fastings often. In cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, 
that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? And then he says, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. So he's sitting there saying it's not the fact that I had 5,000 soul revival here, 10,000 soul revival here, but what I glory in is I know that God has got a way in the making of a man of God to keep me humble so the power of God can continue to rest upon me. There's some of you, you may have prayed once, you may have prayed twice, I need this away from me, I need this. And the discerning between a thorn in the flesh and, and a temptation that does so easily beset us, all of those things come with reason of use by experience in the kingdom of God. But friend, I'm here to tell you there are certain things in your life just so you don't get exalted, just so you don't get puffed up because God is going to use a humble vessel, God is going to use a meek vessel, God God is going to use a lowly vessel. God is going to use dead flesh. God is going to have all of the glory for all the great things God wants to do in our lives. Hallelujah. Why don't we just give glory to the Lord right now? God is good. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, God. Thank you, King Jesus. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. And lest again, you think that Paul was an anomaly on this in 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse number 6, we read what he writes, this highest of heights. Peter writes amazingly under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in First and Second Peter, just incredible stuff, and seeding great and precious promise, all of this. And so he says this in verse 6. He says, wherein ye greatly rejoice. So he's talking to all these people in the places that are mentioned earlier in 1 Peter, Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, uh, Bithynia, the strangers scattered abroad. And he's saying, you greatly rejoice. Now, they had good church. That's what he's saying. And, uh, I mean, they worship God. I thank God for Pentecostal worship. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And so I think if the Jews worshipped, if David worshipped, David didn't have the Holy Ghost the way we have it today. If David could worship in death, friend, we ought to worship. And we get hints of that all throughout the epistles. You know, Paul says, if I'm beside myself, it's for your sake. That means he's getting down preaching. Hallelujah. And so they greatly rejoiced. Isn't it good just to have the Holy Ghost, to have the name of Jesus? That's the greatest thing in all the world. You get that right, everything else is really just incidental. Hallelujah. And they greatly rejoice just because they're saved. Hallelujah. You might not can pay your school bill, but if you're saved, you can still greatly rejoice. So Peter says this, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. Let's everybody say fire. Fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So basically he says, you're a bunch of worshiping maniacs, but you're going through a very hard time. That tells me I'm not going to let Satan take my praise from me when I'm going through a difficult time. I'm going to worship God in the valley because I know that all things are working together for my good to those who are the called according to his purpose, those who love God. So I worship God because of his excellent greatness. He doesn't have to let me win Publishers Clearinghouse to let me worship him. I don't have to get $10,000 in the mail. Man, I got the Holy Ghost. I got the name of Jesus. He's on the throne. He's good. I get heaven. That's enough for me to worship him. So I worship him according to his excellent greatness. Praise God. You can be seated. But that's not the only place. There's other places. We'll just examine uh, maybe a couple more. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 through 34. And, and I would believe, you know, God used Paul as a human author here. Others would say Timothy, Apollos, Barnabas. It doesn't really matter. We know it's inspired of God. Hallelujah. They were just vessels. And, uh, but 
the call to remembrance, the former days, in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds, and now look at this, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. That means the government, evidently it was the government, because they had converted to Christianity, and there's many things throughout church history, especially early church history, of this happening, that when you were converted, they took your goods. They took joyfully the spoiling of their goods. Knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. So when whatever forces these were that were mentioned that took the goods of the Hebrew Christians, they were just like, praise God, take this whole world, give me Jesus. Uh, Nobody's shouting, hallelujah. Now, I remember years ago, I went to preach in Mombasa, Kenya, and it was a fascinating time. We were right across from a mosque there, and it was uh, one of the more unique times in my life and my ministry. And uh, that was preaching at a local church. But we also did a crusade under the missionaries that were there in Kenya at the time. And and it was in Mombasa, which is 25% Muslim. A lot of things about Mombasa. It's there on the Indian Ocean. Sister Walter and I, we have ridden uh, camels on the Indian Ocean on Mother's Day, if I remember. And I remember the guy doing the camel. He said, well, you're riding George, king of the camels. I'm like, well, you know. How do you know this is George King and the camel? And, and he's like, you know, he's looking at me like, well, you're such an idiot. And he had some box around his neck that indicated that he was, in fact, king of the camels. Who knows? It could have been just a financial scam. <laughs> but we were there, and I remember at the crusade day after day, there was like rows of housing projects, and there were denominational churches and the Muslims had people living in these housing projects, and they would give them a dollar a day. Well, often, they would, people would come from those housing projects and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they would come up and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And uh, they would commit their lives to follow Jesus, get baptized in Jesus' name. And the missionary said, now, you really don't realize everything that's going on. You know, I'm just a Westerner. I'm coming from, at that time, the Atlanta, Georgia area over there. I did not know the lay of the land. But he says, when these Muslims, there were Muslims getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he said, when they get the baptism of the Holy Ghost here, and I'm not sure if it's this way worldwide. I know it was there at that particular location in Mombasa, Kenya. He said, the first thing that will happen is the Muslim housing authority will kick them out. And so they are saying they're going to be vagrants. When they get the Holy Ghost, they know that Jesus is their Savior, and they're accepting Jesus. They lose their dollar a day, which was at that time, 2001, the standard living wage in Kenya. I don't think it's gone up much. I checked just uh, a few weeks ago on that. And so they lose their dollar a day, and they lose their housing. But they would rather have the Holy Ghost and be vagrants than to to keep a house. And then the Muslims do as other religions do. They said they would actually have a funeral for them, for their family, and then they would refuse it. If they went up to their father, their mother, any family member, they would actually turn their back and say, you don't exist. You know, they they wouldn't say you don't exist. They would just act as if the person was not there. So I remember seeing some... Something like this in action took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. And it's, it's at those times where you really check yourself. You know Acts 2.38 is right. You know the oneness of God is right. You know holiness of life is right. But you realize here you are preaching and you're making people vagrants. And so you had better know 100% that what they're getting is better than their house and their dollar a day. Now, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall 
suffer persecution. Second Timothy 2, 3 says, And your hardness is a good soldier in Christ Jesus. One of the greatest soldiers we read about in the Bible is King David. He was that classic man with a, a velvet glove over an iron fist. He could play music and at the same time be a mighty warrior. At uh, age 15, approximately, he killed a lion and a bear. He could have been 12, 13. That's just approximations. Around the age of 16, he was anointed and went into Saul's service. It's somewhere around age 17. Some would say a little younger. Some would say a little older. But around age 17, he killed Goliath. Somewhere around age 18, 19, he married the king's daughter, Michelle. From the time he was 22 to the time he was 30, somewhere around eight to nine years, he was on the run. And he was anointed king, and the only people he was king over was about 400 of seemingly the worst of the land. By the time he was 30, he finally became king just over a certain segment of Israel, and at 37 and a half, he became king over United Israel. At age 51, he suffered a horrific moral failure that would haunt him the rest of his life. And by the time he was 65, he was forced to dictate the throne by his son Absalom and then come back to the throne to live out his days. You see, in David's life, he's the sweet psalmist of Israel. In David's life, he wrote somewhere around 90 of the Psalms. Some would say more, some would say less, but somewhere around 90 of the Psalms. He was inspired by God to do that. He was in the lineage of Messiah. Whenever you look back at great kings, it is always David. David is someone who seemingly will play a role in the future millennial reign of Christ. Whenever you hear Jesus talked about, so often it's the son of Abraham, the son of David, as his genealogy and generations are introduced to us in the book of Matthew. So this David did not always have it so easy. This David was persecuted by a king. This David was persecuted by a wife. This David had threatens of death even by the few hundred men that he had as Ziklag was destroyed and on fire. This David, even when he was anointed king and he finally received the promise that he had gotten over a decade before, he was only king over a small or a certain percentage of that that hadn't promised him. His life was full of battles. His life was full of ups, and his life was full of downs. His life was full of tragedy. His life reads, some people call parts of his life story the soap opera of the Bible because of the different things that are related in that portion of Scripture. But yet he was called of God, and David never forgot that before he was king and before before he was anointed, he was just a shepherd boy that was in love with God. Friend, you don't ever need to forget. You might be youth president of a state sometime. Somebody here might become general superintendent of the UPCI if the Lord tarries that long. You don't know. You might pastor the largest church in North America, but what you have got to constantly remember is that you are just a little person. You are just somebody that God loves that you are somebody that Jesus hung on the, on the cross for and that before you were any of those things, you were a praiser, you were a dancer, you were worshiping at your youth group when there was only three people there. You were dancing around the halls of IBC Chapel. You've got to remember your first love. Why don't we give glory to the Lord right now? He's good. can be seated. The list is so long. Joseph at 17 has dreams and, and uh, then becomes a slave and then a prisoner slave. Moses at 40 seeks to deliver the people at 80 is when he begins to deliver the people. Noah begins to build an ark at 500. Joshua has to go through decades as an assistant pastor and a second man before he ever gets qualified to lead the people of God. 
God has given you and I the greatest thing in all the world. We've received the pearl of great price. We've received the treasure in the field. It's up to you and I to defend it, to contend earnestly for it, to keep a great relationship with Jesus. We need to remember that delayment of gratification seems to be a scriptural principle, that we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and then we live a life that that uh, sometimes doesn't go the way we want it to, but if we're serving Jesus Christ, it goes the way God wants it to. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, but delayment of gratification is a great scriptural principle. And through God, all things are possible. Anything is possible. One of the things that I love about the epistles, just in a general looking at the epistles, when you look at First and Second Corinthians, the term Corinthianized was even in Shakespeare's day. It was 1,600 years beyond the New Testament. It was known throughout the world as an epitaph of debauchery and wickedness. You see, Corinth was a city, as you learn in the life of Paul and other classes, geography. It was on a, a, a isthmus, and it reached about 17, 18 miles wide, and there was Corinth on one side, Corinth on another. There was uh, bays on both sides of it. And so it was constantly receiving from all over the world. And because of that, all of the different gods, all of the different worships, all of the different debaucheries, all the different things that sailors in ancient times would bring into a city was brought into Corinth. Yet when Paul got to Corinth in Acts chapter 18, God spoke to him and said, Paul, there is much people in this city. And he saw a lot of people baptized. As a matter of fact, he saw the ruler of the synagogue baptized. And then the person that took his place as the ruler of the synagogue, Sosthenes, when he's writing 1 Corinthians, he says, Sosthenes got it as well. That's like seeing the biggest church in your city getting baptized in Jesus' name and receiving the Holy Ghost. Friend, I'm here to tell you, if Paul can have revival in Corinth, he can have revival in the United States of America. Rome was a wicked city. When Vesuvius went off in 79 AD and, and buried Pompeii and Heraclium and buried them in motion, as archaeologists have uncovered from all the pumice and the ash that was there, they realized just how debauched Roman culture was. The different historians of Rome, such as Livy and Tacitus and Suetonius and others, remind us of the abortions and the infanticide and the rapes and the horrific things, the homosexuality that went on at the very highest levels of Rome. But yet we find an amazing church at Rome. If God can have revival in Rome, God can have revival anywhere. In Galatia, one of the provinces of Galatia was Lycaonia. The very term, the medical term for werewolfism is lycanthropo. It comes from Lycaonia because the people were considered absolute wild men, absolute savages. Friend, I'm going to tell you, if God can have revival in Galatia, God can have revival in the United States of America. In Philippi. You just had some ladies meeting by the riverside because in all of Philippi, this major city of Europe, this amazing city, there was not 10 religious Jews to have a synagogue, 10 religious male Jews that had been bar mitzvah. They didn't even have enough there to have a synagogue. It was a place of debauchery. It was a place of wickedness. It was a place of evilness. And yet there was revival in Philippi. If God can have revival in Philippi, he can have revival in the United States of America. Ephesus, where that seventh wonder of the world was, the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, a great banking center. All types of things were at Ephesus. They made shrines. People came from all over the then known world to come and worship at Ephesus. It is a debauched place. Some of you may have been there. Many of you may have been there on trips to Turkey and that type thing. I'm going to tell you if God can tear down, so to speak, the spiritual influence of one of the seven wonders of the world of that day, God can have revival in the United States of America. But we do have to endure hardness. We have to go through this process of the making of a man of God. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, we'll come to a quick close here. 
Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. Pergamos. Seven more epistles here. So many people, and I'm not saying they are not typological of seven church ages, but I am saying that in the primary context, these were seven literal churches in Asia. And so we can learn from that. And so Jesus is is speaking here, and, and he says, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest. He's talking to the angel, which would be where the church was. Angel probably, long story, probably some type of pastor, minister there. In the synagogue, the the prayer warrior that sat at the entrance of the synagogue and prayed was known as the angel. So they would have some concept there, but it seems obvious it's it's a ministry. It's a man of God. It's, It's an earthly something called an angel in ministry, be that as it may. He says, I know thy work, singular. He's talking to the angel. And where thou wellest, and that has great spiritual import as well, that what you are so often your church will be as well, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, you plural, where Satan dwelleth. Now, the altar of Zeus at Pergamos, it has been had a history of, of lore and legend. As a matter of fact, Adolf Hitler was so enamored with it that there had been a legend that whoever had this altar of Zeus, which seems to be the reference to where Satan's seat was in Pergamos, where this altar of Zeus at Pergamos was, that whoever possessed that, they would rule the world. And we do know Hitler was a very superstitious man, Thule Society, sending people to India, Nepal, other things, swastika, was the ancient uh, Ayurvedic symbol and, and, and these type things. And so he was a very superstitious man. And so he actually stole it and brought it to Germany because he felt like whoever possessed that, there was that legend there. Now, we know by the words of Jesus Christ that that seems to be, now, the spiritual import that that's where Satan's seat was, is that where the center of satanic uh, operations were in the world at that time? Maybe. I, I don't know. That's, that's a vast discussion for another time. But he says Satan's seat was there in Pergamos, and the church was right there where Satan's seat was. I'm going to tell you the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. We had at our church, we had a Hindu temple get built across the street from us. Some of our people got just a little bit scared about that. I said, don't you be scared about that. That'll be the new youth center one time. Because greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. You can have revival where Satan seed is. Why don't we just give glory to the Lord right now? Glory to the name of Jesus. Just another quick few moments. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 6 and 23, we read startling words that people constantly try to explain away. There's really no way to explain them away. It's funny to me that sometimes when we run across a a difficult scripture for us to swallow, it's like, can somebody Greek that away somehow? You know, can somebody give me some Greek so I don't have to obey that? You know what I'm saying? Somebody tell me why that was cultural and I can keep doing my own thing. All right. Colossians chapter 1, verse number 6, which has come unto you, talking about the gospel, verse number 5, context you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come unto you as it is in all the world. So this is somewhere about 25 years after Paul's conversion, give or take just a short amount of time, somewhere about 25 years, maybe not even 25 years, And he said, the gospel's coming to the whole world and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God and truth. When you come down to verse 23, we see this reemphasized. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, 
and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which, which preached to every creature which is under heaven. So some would try to regionalize it and just say, well, that's the Roman world. That's the Roman Empire. Now, even if that's so, that's from Iran to Great Britain. That's still massive. But it does say every creature under heaven. Within 25 years, without DVDs, without YouTube, without social media, without anything else, they had preached the gospel to the whole world. Somebody's already trying to Greek it out, I can tell. Did they really? I'm telling you, we've got the same power of the Holy Ghost today. Here in in the United States of America, there are 19,505 cities in the United States alone. 19,505 cities in the United States alone. There is about 4,100 preaching points, daughter works, and churches in the United States. And many of those are in cities with multiple churches. There is still much ground to be won here in the United States of America. We need an emphasis to our small and our mid-sized cities. We have a daughter work in a city of about 6,000. On the way there, I pass through a city of 2,200 and a city of 550, and I am burdened. It's about an hour and 15 minutes from the church that I pastor. And I sit there and say, are we just to relegate these 2,200 people in Arlington, Georgia, and 550 people in Leary, Georgia, to hell? Friend, I'm going to tell you, the fields are white. They are all ready to harvest. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what you have heard about church growth and church planting. You and Jesus Christ make a majority. I'm not telling you to do anything rash or stupid, but I am telling you that if you go, that Jesus wants that city saved worse than you and I do. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Old timers look for the will of God and did not look so much at the natural circumstances that it seems our lot to have in the year 2017. And God worked, and there are churches in cities of 700, 115, and 500 all over the United States of America because somebody said, God's got a church right there. Hallelujah. I love urban areas. I was born in an urban area, Atlanta, Georgia. I love urban areas, but I'm telling you, the gospel needs to go to everybody, (laughs) not just urban areas as well. Muslims five times every day throw out a prayer rug, and it doesn't matter where they're at, and it doesn't matter the ridicule they receive. They do it. Even in a contrary culture, they do it. Even through fear of death, they do it. 1 Timothy 2.8 says, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. I wonder if we started doing that, what would the results be? We can make fun of the doctrines of the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons all we desire. But the Jehovah's Witnesses are willing to be ridiculed and almost universally made a pariah and made fun of to spread a gospel that cannot save about a God that is not presented in the Scripture. The Mormons will pay their own way, as you hear often, to go on a two-year missions trip. Even where I'm from, Jimmy Carter, Southern Baptist. I was just talking to him the other day, as a matter of fact. President Carter, he signed some books for Sister Waldron and I. He took a week missions trip to go from South Georgia to Boston, Massachusetts, to Doorknock, to spread a gospel that cannot save and that cannot deliver and cannot heal. The song of our forebears was, He's never failed me yet. He's never failed me yet. Jesus Christ has never failed me yet. Everywhere I go, I want the world to know that Jesus has never failed me yet. Let's all stand to our feet. We're living in a disintegrating society. The Scripture says in Matthew 24 and 10, if you want to know why there's so much contention in the world today, it says this, 
and when then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And so we're living in that day where people of different ethnicities, different socioeconomic status, that there is a, a balkanization going on. I'm here to tell you, I see the fields white, all ready to harvest. I want God to make me the person he wants me to be. So I'll go spread that glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and see souls saved. It doesn't matter if it's at Satan's seat. It doesn't matter if it's Colossae. It doesn't matter if it's Philippi. It doesn't matter if it's at Ephesus. It doesn't matter if it's at Laodicea. God's got a people. Hallelujah. Why don't we just glorify the Lord right now? God, I glorify you. I love you. I worship you. I praise you, God. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the name of Jesus. I love you, God. I'm just going to ask you, if you want God to make you and to mold you, and I know you've prayed that many times before. This is just another in that long journey. Why don't you come forward right now? Why don't you just lift your hands to Jesus and say, God, I'll do anything for you. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say. Wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do, Lord Jesus Christ. God, I received this amazing training here at Indiana Bible College. And God, then you send me forth into the harvest field. God, I'll lift up holy hands. I'll do whatever, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. God, which is my reasonable service. I never forget, God, I'm just a child of yours. I'm just somebody that loves you. I got the Holy Ghost when I was eight, dancing. That's who I am. Hallelujah. I glorify you. I love you. Jesus, make us, mold us, God, into your image, into your likeness. God, let us see this gospel preached everywhere under heaven. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to every creature under heaven. And then shall the end come. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let it happen. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Never let us be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us take joyfully the spoiling of our goods, God. In Jesus' name. Let us great rejoice. Though now, if we be in manifold temptations, if need be, O oh God, we rejoice. God, I glorify you. I love you. I praise you. Glory to the name of Jesus. Why don't you just ask the Lord? Hallelujah. I'll abandon it all for the sake of the cause.